10 years ago, what instigated us into going into windrow burning was in a loop and wheat rotation, generally. And the radish were blowing out in the lupins because it's really only one chemical that you've got in, in the lupin phase. So, and not every crop was windrowed over the 10 years. It started being the broadleaf crops and then we then brought it into the wheat phase where we had to, where just to give it a two or three year in a row, really good concentrated effort on getting the weed numbers down and they are now Particularly this year, we did not have to spray our lupins for radish. Uh, with the header front, you can really be never low enough to try and get all the weeds into the front. Um, this year in particular, you know, we, we try and say uh, coat can height as a height across the board. Of course, that doesn't necessarily happen, but in general, if, if you're aiming at that height, when the front goes up and down, you know, it will still uh, save the windrow and contain it in the windrow when you go to try and burn them. Um, so that's really all we do at the front. The shoot at the back um, is very simple really. It's just the width of, the, of your shaker tray and then the angle down to a minimum gap of 500 mil at the base. So that's for the trash to flow out and as high as you can get it off the ground as well so it, the trash will flow out the bottom particularly in big canola crops, or if it comes a bit damp, it can sort of stall there, and you want that to really be able to flow out. And also the back being open. So if it does stall, it's got a chance to bounce out the back of it, rather than be contained to go down the chute. In canola, if we ever stop the header, you back up straight away and purely because if it's a very bulky crop and it would, would definitely stop on the windrow and you need to back back to clear that bottom so you can start again. And that is where you have your biggest issues with a windrow on the back is in canola. And in particular, if you're going into the night where it gets a bit tougher and it's not as brittle, so it's sort of sticking together. And um, this year we've, we've put cameras up to the side at the back uh, more, I guess, for, for our casual drivers who aren't really familiar with what we're doing. So if you stop and you back up, you can see the windrower. If it's not clear, you then can get out, pull it out before your back of your header fills up, which isn't that pleasant. Last year, we windrowed basically all our program. In a, in a big year, big yielding year, so we had very big windrows. We got bottlenecked at the start of the season to try and burn all those windrows in time for seeding. So we were basically burning two days ahead of the seeder this year. So that sort of caused us logistics issues. And in saying that, sometimes they don't get a chance to burn right through because you're trying to rush it and you're burning more through the night. Well, surprisingly enough, it dries out very quick. We had that scenario last this year, actually, and it actually did wonders for containing the fire in the windrow. And what it does is, one, it only takes a few days to, for the top half of the windrow to dry out. And even the bottom, the bottom can still be a bit damp, but as a, as a fuel lights, it actually dries it out as it goes. And it ends up doing a great job, even though there was some residue still on the ground there was enough heat on top uh, to, to nuke the seeds as well. So yeah, you don't, it's, it doesn't need to be crispy dry because it's better if it's not in the fact of you want to get the heat into the windrow, but you also need to contain the paddock. So, and that's where it is tricky. That, that's, that's where experience comes into it, you know, that, yeah.